I need a show of hands. How many of you out there would like to buy a Jaguar? What if I told you, that's not as many as I thought, what if I told you, maybe a lot of you own a car, a Jaguar, <laughs> that I could give you four simple rules to negotiate with the dealer of a Jaguar that are so good, that are so easy to use, you'll be able to buy that car, any one of us, tomorrow. I think you'd all like to hear the speech, and I'd like to give that speech. <laughs> all right, I'll bite. I I'll bite. Oh. I can't. I don't have four special rules that are going to allow you to put more money into your pocket. But maybe you'd like a Cadillac, or maybe a Buick, or maybe a Jeep, like I have. Maybe you'd like to buy a house. Maybe you're thinking of buying a house. All of us have negotiated in the past. We negotiated with our kids. We negotiated with our parents, we negotiated at work. For the last five or so years, I have been basically negotiating on behalf of a large multinational corporation on asbestos litigation, litigation that is worth millions of dollars if it went to trial and they got a verdict against them. Basically every month, intensely negotiating cases, sometimes several cases worth that, that much money. So I sat down and I wanted to put together a list of ten things, ten principles or rules that I used in my negotiations that worked, that were necessary. And I came up with 11 rules. I wasn't too happy. It's not an even number. <laughs> <laughs> but I realized that negotiating a lawsuit really isn't any different than negotiating a car or negotiating a business deal or a contract or buying a house. Sure, the content is different. What you're negotiating about is different. But the principles are really the same, and, they, and they're applicable. So I came up with simple rules but unwritten rules, basically, that are followed when I negotiated with, with these cases. And I want to use tonight the simple example of buying a car, buying a Cadillac, or a Caddy, as my title introduced, to demonstrate four of the most important rules that I found, four of the 11. Rule number one, I hope you can see that, be objectively realistic. I think this is probably the most important rule and that's why I listed it as number one. And I think if it's followed, it gives you the best chance of buying that car or successfully concluding that negotiation. You have to accurately value that Cadillac to know what its value is and to know what you're willing to pay for it before you can sit down and actually negotiate for it. For instance, if you go home and you determine that that Jaguar is objectively valued at $85,000 and you have $50,000 in your pocket, you probably ought to not visit the dealer. If your real estate agent is telling you that she or she has looked at the houses around your market and your house is worth $250,000, but you're bullheaded and you're not going to take a penny less than $350,000, you probably better plan to stay in that house a little bit longer. The theory is, and this is my theory, maybe other people's theory, but it's my theory. I think there is one realistic, there is one market value or range for that Cadillac you're about to buy, or that house that you want to sell, or that Jaguar that you want to sell, or that contract that you want to negotiate. If you are able and willing to objectively and accurately value that Cadillac and know what it's actually worth, you put yourself in the best position, assuming that you're willing to pay the accurate value, or inaccurate and realistic value, you put yourself in the best position of being able to buy it. So how do you value a Cadillac? Well, it's pretty pretty simple. There are some, some things you can do. First of all, in today's time, it's a big car. You may have to in, or decrease the value a little bit because of gas prices, if it's a, a big gas guzzler. If you're trying to buy a Prius, you may have to think about increasing what you might think the value of that Prius might be. I remember years ago, I'm probably dating myself, but there was the Mazda Miata that first came out. People were loving that car. They were buying it for above the sticker price. So you couldn't look at the sticker price and say that's the realistic value, what I might expect to pay for that car. You had to increase the value. You look at the seller's situation, the dealer's situation. Does he have a floor plan? Does he have to pay a monthly amount in order to buy the car that he wants to sell you? If he does, that Cadillac that's been sitting on that lot for a long time has a lower value than the Cadillac he just bought and hasn't paid any interest on yet. 
What's the price that he pays the dealer for that car? What is the condition of the car? Now, if you're buying the new Cadillac, it may not matter so much, but there may be some factors involved in that. If it's a used Cadillac, obviously the condition of the car, something you'd want to take into account, it's going to affect the value. The seller has to do the same thing that you're doing. The bottom line is you're going to use all of these factors and a lot more to argue or negotiate, try and convince the seller that your price is right. But the bottom line is before you go to buy that Cadillac, you need to find out objectively what it's worth and then know what you're willing to pay for it. What is your bottom line? That's a separate rule. It's not here tonight, but it's one of the other 11. Rule number two, mean what you say and say what you mean. You have valued the car accurately. You know what you're willing to pay for it. And now you go in and you look at the sticker price. What do you say next unless you're going to say, I'll take it? Most of us aren't going to say, I'll take it. Some of us are. Most of us aren't. There are a number of things, a number of ways that we're not going to get into tonight that you can do to say, to start the negotiations. But the one rule in this rule is don't say anything that you don't mean. Don't say anything that you're not willing to accept. Negotiation is really about sending smoke signals. You're sending signals to the other side about what you will and what you won't take, about what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. You need to send signals and you need to read signals from the other side. I often I refer to this in the opposite as the weasel principle. Now, some of you might think that since I'm a lawyer, it doesn't bother me that someone might fudge on the promise that they made. But say the uh, person who's about to buy the car says to me, I might buy that car for $40,000, but 45000 that you're asking is too much. Well, then I say to him, okay, great, sold. I'll take $40,000. But he comes back and he says, well, I said might. I said I might take forty. I really don't want to take forty. I really only give you $38,000. He's lost all credibility with me. Okay, he said forty, and he won't take forty thousand dollars. Lawyers, I should have written this down. Lawyers don't like weasels, <laughs> and neither neither do normal people. Don't mention a dollar figure unless you're willing to accept it. Period. It goes both ways. It goes that way for the seller. If the dealer says to you, "I might be able to get you that car for forty thousand dollars," what signal has he told you? You can buy that car for forty thousand dollars. And if you come back and you say, I'll take $40,000, and he says, oops, can't do it, you better think about walking out of the dealership. He's not worth dealing with. He's violated my rule. And if he knows my rule, he wouldn't violate it. You don't have to necessarily mention money if you're talking uh, to try and send a signal. You can say, for instance, I can't pay what you're asking. I can pay a little more than, than maybe what I've offered, but we've got to be closer to my number than we are to your number. Have you told him what you, you take? No. But you've given him an idea that he has to be less than halfway of the difference between the two of you. 